sorry okay the recording has started uh yes i i, I think that uh, a feedback form will come in uh, for you to give feedback on your classes uh, but if you have any specific feedback that you would like to give i'll i'll just confirm about whether uh, it'll come to all students from the bible college itself uh, and then if not then i may just post a form on classroom but i i think one will come from the bible college so please uh, take the time to give the feedback it'll just help us for future classes to um to try and improve in the in different areas whether it's in the teaching or in the assignments uh different things like that for our classes uh please do give your feedback and uh tell us some things that worked for you some things that helped you learn uh some things that maybe we could look at changing or doing in a different way that would be a little more helpful uh so we'll continue from where we stopped uh when second corinthians chapter 11 verses 22 to 33 if someone could read that for us please are they hebrew so i am are they israelites so i am are they the seed of abraham so i am are they ministers of christ i speak as a fool i am more in labor in in labors more abundant in stripe in stripes above measure in prisons more frequently in death often from the jews five times i received 40 stripes minus one three times i was beaten with rods once i was stoned three times i was shipwrecked a night and a day i have been in deep in journeys often in perils of water in perils of robbers in perils of my own countrymen in perils of gentiles in perils of cities of city in perils of wilderness in perils in the sea in perils among false brethren in weariness and in toil in sleeplessness in sleeplessness often in hunger in thirst in fastings often in cold and nakedness besides the other things what does what comes upon me daily my deep concern for all the churches who is weak i am not weak who is made to stumble and i do not burn with in, in the indignation if i must boast i will boast in the things which concern my infirmity the lord the god and the father of all jesus christ who is blessed forever knows that i am not lying in damascus the governor under arrestus the king was guarding the city of the damascus damascus with a garrison desiring to apprehend me but i was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands amen amen thank you so uh here we see how um paul now uh, goes into this uh kind of uh debate or comparison between uh these other uh uh other opponents the those who are coming against him and calling themselves apostles uh and he talks in their way like on his on their standards but he also shifts so he starts with what are just some uh some fleshly qualifications right he are the hebrews are the israelites are they the seed of abraham uh those are the first three questions he asks but then he goes into are they ministers of christ uh and if so uh what is it that proves that they are ministers of christ or what is it that proves that paul himself is a minister of christ uh while these uh these other ministers were boasting in uh themselves were boasting in their abilities uh to teach to speak or uh, were boasting in uh 
the practice of financial support, whatever it is that they were by they were comparing themselves to one another. Those were the things in which they were boasting and finding uh, reasons to be proud of themselves. Uh, Paul, on the other hand, boasts in his weakness, right? He boasts in the challenges, uh, in uh, the sacrifices that he made uh, as proof that he's doing all of this. He's going through all of this suffering uh, as someone who is truly genuine truly wants to serve Christ. And it doesn't matter all the suffering that he goes through. Uh, he is willing to do that because he is a true minister of Christ. And that is proof of uh, the fact that he's a minister of Christ. It's not in his speech or in his um, in his um, skills or in how he compares to other ministers uh, in outwardly appearance, right? Like what he talked about earlier. Uh, so he lists, uh, there's a long list of a lot of things. We know uh, the different things that Paul experienced from uh, the different letters, from the accountant acts, uh, things that he went through. And this provides that uh, kind of a summary, a list of all the things that he went through. Um, but he goes all the way right back uh, by the end of the chapter to uh, what uh, happened in his first time when he reached Damascus and he began to preach there. Uh, so almost saying that right from the start of his ministry, he has experienced persecution. He has experienced challenges. Uh, and that has been the mark of his ministry, uh, has been the suffering, has been the persecution, has been the sacrifice that he has made. Um, so we see uh, different kinds of challenges that he faced, right? So uh, he talks about persecution. He talks about physical danger as he's traveled overseas. Um, he talks about uh, as he's traveled in the wilderness, as he uh, then he talks about challenges from false uh, false brethren. So uh, challenges coming in from within the church as well as outside the church. He talks about uh, physical challenges, so tiredness, sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, fasting cold, nakedness. Uh, so just those um, physical ways in which he's experienced uh, suffering uh, in his own body. Then he talks about emotional uh, challenges, his concern for the churches. Uh, when he, uh, as he continues to oversee the churches, when he hears about things that are going on there, he himself experiences the pain that they are experiencing. If they are weak, he feels weak. If uh, someone is in sin, then he feels concerned over their sin. Uh, and so he has that emotional, that spiritual burden for the churches as as well. Um, and then uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, confidence is in the Lord himself, knowing that whatever Paul is talking about is truth. So verse 31, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ knows that I am not lying. So that is where uh, he can be confident in what he's saying. He's not boasting in frivolous things. He's just giving an account of what he has experienced. He's talking about uh, what he's actually gone through for the sake of Christ. Uh, and then verse 32 and 33 talks about that first account of uh, being in Damascus. Um, so from there, we go into the next chapter. And uh, Paul will talk a little bit more about uh, his weakness uh, and uh, why he's talking about these things and boasting in these things. So we can read chapter 12. Someone uh, can read from verse 1 to 6. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast, 
I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it, which it is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one, I will boast. Yet of myself, I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees to me to to be or hearers to uh, to be or hears from me thank you so um here um Paul begins to talk about a vision and he doesn't uh, mention clearly whether he's talking about himself or someone else because he just says, I know a man in Christ. But from the way he continues to talk after this, it is clear that he is uh, actually talking about a vision that he himself had. Uh, the reason why he's talking in third person is uh, to not take glory in this right uh, he is talking about this experience uh, but he doesn't want to uh, be glorified beyond what is uh, what is right for him so he says in verse 6 think of me above what he sees me he doesn't want anyone uh, to think of him more highly than he actually uh, is right uh, he will only boast uh, he will only speak the truth and he will boast in his weakness if he's boasting about himself he will boast in his weakness that's what he says in verse 5 um so he had this vision uh, 14 years ago which was probably about 10 years after he had become a believer and uh the in this vision he is caught up uh, so uh, this uh, we see this in a lot of the visions even in john uh, in uh, revelation where he's taken up to the uh, presence of god and so uh, paul seems to have had a similar experience he was caught up uh, he isn't even sure if he was physically there or it was just a spiritual thing but uh, it was so real so vivid that uh, he knew that uh, he knew that he definitely took place. He doesn't know how exactly he was there in spirit or in body. Uh, but he knows that he was in the heavens. Uh, so he says the third heaven. Um, this in uh, in Jewish thought uh, was uh, the highest heaven, which was where God himself was. A uh, paradise that would come down to earth at some point where heaven would be on earth. But at this time was a place that was uh, where God's presence was. And so Paul is taken up into this place. And in verse 4, he says, I heard inexpressible, uh, inexpressible words, uh, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So he had not talked about this experience at all until this time. Uh, so we see here another example of what Paul is choosing to boast in, right? Uh, just to see that contrast between those uh, other ministers and Paul. Uh, here again, Paul is talking about uh, revelation that God had given him, an experience that God had given him, something that Paul had never talked about before. But in this case, uh, he's in um, such a... Um, difficult position of having to defend himself against these opponents and to prove himself to the church at Corinth to, for their own good, for their own protection. And so he chooses to talk about this. He doesn't give a lot of information, uh, but enough to say that he had this uh, experience with God and had received great revelation uh, that was too much for him to talk about, which is why he has not brought it up until now. He'd never talked about it. Um, we'll go on from there, verses 7 to 10. If someone can read that for us, please. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, 
a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this, I concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, thank you, John. So here, um, Paul continues, and now he talks about why he is boasting in. So he boasted in a lot of the uh, challenges, the sacrifices, the uh, suffering that he had experienced. And here is where he explains why he talked about all of those things. Uh, so he starts in verse 7, saying, um, he had received this great revelation 14 years ago. So it was a long, long time ago, right? 14 years ago, for someone who had not at all talked about it. Uh, he had received such great revelation. Uh, and because the revelation was so great, there was also a thorn in the flesh uh, given to him. Now he goes on to explain what that thorn in the flesh is. Uh, so we have seen so many uh, people think uh, try to uh, explain what was that thorn in the flesh and usually people think about it in a more uh, in a physical way like talking about some kind of sickness some kind of physical illness or uh, infirmity that Paul experienced. But Paul himself talks about what the thorn in the flesh is. So he says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Uh, so this uh, seems to be uh, some uh, an angel uh, of Satan, right? Someone who was sent by Satan to buffet me. So uh, the meaning of buffet is um, something to oppose, something to strike, something to come against uh, him. And so uh, what we can understand from Buffett is that all of those sufferings that he talked about before this are uh, the ways in which Satan was opposing the work he was doing. Uh, and so he again lists all of those things here in these verses that we just read. Uh, we look at that again. So why was that? Uh, messenger of Satan sent so that Paul would not be exalted. Uh, he would not receive more glory than was due to him. So that revelation was from God. It was not something uh, that Paul could boast about in himself, right? And so, so that he would not start to glory in himself or other people would not start to uh, give him uh, undue glory that was not uh, right for a human being to receive. Uh, he was given these challenges to keep him humble, to keep him dependent on God. Uh, so uh, one uh, thing for us to take away from this is uh, a lot of times people use this as uh, an explanation for why uh, sickness may not be taken away from them or something uh, is uh, left with them even though they've been praying for God to take it away. But we see here in Paul's example that it was not taken away for a very specific reason. So Paul had received a great abundance of revelation. He was someone who God used mightily. If we look at the, uh, the New Testament, Paul has written a major part of the New Testament, right? And um, Paul had experienced this great, uh, this vision, this experience of being in the presence of God, hearing a revelation in the presence of God. And uh, because he had such great revelation, these challenges were, uh, God allowed him to have these challenges to keep him in a place of humility and dependence on God. But none of us can claim to have that kind of uh, that kind of authority, spiritual authority or revelation that Paul had, right? So, uh, this was given in a very specific reason for Paul himself. 
And so we shouldn't have the same expectation that God will send uh, or uh, God will allow uh, such suffering on us because we don't have that same level of revelation that Paul had. So it was in Paul's specific case that God allowed it and God himself speaks to him about why uh, it was allowed in his case. Okay, so this should not be used, uh, this verse or this experience of Paul should not be used by us to say that we can stay in a place of sickness, we can stay in a place of suffering because uh, because uh, God is allowing us to be weak so we can depend on him. Uh, that is not the context in which Paul was experiencing it. Uh, so we'll continue into verse 9. Uh, so Paul uh, prays for that thorn to be taken away, for that messenger of Satan to be taken away. And God speaks to him and says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Uh, and this is why Paul boasts in these sufferings, because when he experiences this kind of suffering, when he experiences these challenges, in the, at the same time, the power of God uh, keeps him going, carries him through every suffering, every challenge that he uh, has faced in that long list of challenges that we looked at. And then verse 10, he gives a summary of what those challenges are. He says, I take pleasure in infirmities. So that is the physical, um, the physical challenges that he faced, right? We talked about the hunger, the fasting, the coldness, the nakedness, the sleeplessness. Uh, uh, then he says in reproaches. So reproaches are from within the church, the challenges that were coming in. Uh, sadly, that was coming in even from within the church. Uh, in needs, so in his, whether it be his financial needs, his uh, physical needs, in persecution that was coming from outside the church, uh, in distresses, uh, like uh, he talked about uh, while traveling by sea, while traveling in the wilderness, uh, traveling through all of these different uh, places, uh, the um, the actual uh, threats of nature itself, right? Traveling through storms, traveling uh, at risk, right? In the sea. Uh, so in distresses, all for Christ's sake, right? So this is how we understand what the messenger of Satan was. The messenger of Satan was uh, uh, somebody sent by Satan to hinder the work that Paul was doing through all of these ways, through those infirmities, reproaches, persecutions, needs, distresses. Uh, but in all of that, in his uh, human weakness, he was able to experience divine strength. OK, so that is uh, that is why Paul, even in his boasting, though he chooses to boast in all of these uh, previous chapters, his boasting is not a human boasting. He is boasting in the challenges and the weaknesses because in all of that, uh, he learned that God was sufficient for him. Uh, just depending on God, the power of God was sufficient for him to continue his work. Uh, we'll continue from there, verses 11 to 13. Someone can read that for us. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended by you. For in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly the signs of apostles were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it in which you were inferior to other churches, except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. So here he uh, concludes this whole uh, part in which he's talking about himself and his ministry. Uh, and uh, so he starts in the beginning, says, uh, it is foolish to boast, but I will boast. And then again, he concludes with, I have become a fool in boasting. Um, so he, he in no way is saying that this is the right way to do uh, 
to talk about ministry, but he says, you've left me with no choice. You should have been the one who was supporting me when uh, these other leaders came and talked about me in this way. You should have been the one who was uh, talking about all these things that proved that I was uh, a true minister of God. But because you didn't do it, I am having to do it for myself. Um, and then he says, in no way, in nothing was I less than these apostles who, uh, he uses a lot of sarcastic language. So he's talking about eminent apostles. Later he talks about super apostles. So these people who are uh, who are acting like they are great ministers of God, right? So in there's nothing, uh, no lack in the ministry that I did in the way I served. Uh, even though I myself am nothing, uh, the work that I did was in no way less than what they have done, right? And then um, he says, the signs of an apostle were accomplished. So uh, if we look at all that he's talked about, those are the signs of a true apostle, uh, someone who has worked with purity, with true motivation to serve Christ, to serve the church, someone who has suffered for the sake of the gospel, uh, someone uh, who has been trustworthy in all that they have done, uh, who has been open with the church, who has not manipulated them, has not deceived them, has not used their authority to control or uh, enslave the church in any way. So all of those things are the signs of a true apostle. And uh, he he showed, he proved that he is a true apostle by the way he ministered to them. And apart from the way he ministered to them, there were also signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. So uh, he also, it wasn't only the signs and wonders, and it was not only the, uh, the ministry, but both those things together uh, proved that he was serving in the power of God. And um, and then this last part is, uh, in no way were you inferior except that I didn't choose to receive financial support from you. And again, he's using sarcastic language here. So he's saying, forgive me for not becoming a burden to you. Maybe I should have become a burden and then you would uh, you would truly trust me or you will truly uh, believe that what I'm doing uh, is for your sake, is a genuine work. Um, we can go on from here, verses 14 to 21. If someone can read that, please. Now for the third time, I'm ready to come to you and I will not be burdensome to you. For I do not seek yours, but you. For the for the children ought not to lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. But be that as it may, I will not. I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning. Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, do you think that... Uh, shall we read full till 21? Uh, yes, till 21 okay. you can. Okay. Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ. But we do all things, beloved, for your edification. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do you do not wish. Lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisper, whisperings, conceits, tumults. Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many those who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. Thank you. So uh, here we see uh, Paul coming. Um, he's finished that previous section, and now he's starting uh, 
his conclusion to the letter uh, talking about his next visit to the church. So this will be the third visit to the church. The first time was when the church was established. The second time uh, was uh, when he had this uh, big um, kind of debate with uh, someone from the church. And then he sent Titus with a letter to them. Uh, and then Titus came back and again he wrote Second Corinthians to them. Uh, and so now this is the third visit that he is preparing for. And here again he says he will not take financial support from them. He's talked about receiving financial support for the church in Jerusalem, but for himself he will not take financial support because he views them as a father to uh, and he views them as his children. And it is not right for the children to support the father, to support the parents. Uh, rather, he himself will uh, give everything. He will spend himself completely for their sake. Um, and so he says, I do not seek yours but you. Right? I'm not trying to take your possessions. I don't want anything from you. What I want is you yourself. I want uh, your heart. I want your trust. Uh, I want to have a relationship with you that uh, that is strong. I want to be reconciled to you. Um, so this is uh, very, very important in Paul's ministry here to the church that his heart is for them. It's not for what they can do for him, uh, how they can support him. It is for them to grow, for them to know Christ, for them to be saved. Uh, and he says, I would uh, gladly give all that I am for your salvation, for your souls. Uh, but it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. Uh, but even if that is the case, I will not. Uh, I will not burden you. That is, I will not start to receive financial support from you. Um, and then again, he goes into this uh, language that is sarcastic of, nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by being cunning. Right? So uh, that's the way some people were talking about him, that in some way he had tricked them. Um, or, or he's saying, that's the way you are looking at me. That's the way you're thinking about me. Even though I didn't take any money from you, uh, you're, uh, you're acting or you're thinking about me in this way that I somehow tricked you. Um, did I take advantage of you? So no, no one, uh, I didn't take advantage of you. Neither did Titus, whom I sent to you. Uh, didn't he walk with the same spirit that I walked in, the same way that I walked, I served you? Didn't he do it the same way? Um, and then verse 19, we are not uh, trying to prove ourselves, we're not trying to, uh, uh, we're not trying to uh, explain ourselves to you. Uh, what we are doing is speaking before God himself. Uh, so uh, our final judge, our true judge is God. And so we can speak uh, confidently about the work we've done, about the ministry we've done before God, uh, knowing that God will judge us. God knows not only what we've done, he knows the heart with which we've done it. Um, uh, that we do all things for your edification. We do all things for your good. Um, and then verse 20 and 21, um, he talks about the fear that when he comes, he's going to see uh, continued fighting within the church, jealousy, anger, selfish ambition, distrust. So distrust in the form of backbiting, uh, whispering, uh, pride. Uh, so all of these things, he doesn't want that to be in the church. Uh, he doesn't want to see that in the church when he visits. And so this letter is so that all that might be dealt with before he goes, so that when he visits them, uh, he can visit them and there can be trust, there can be reconciliation, uh, there can be righteousness within the church itself. Uh, and so with the fear that he will go there and see all of these things in the church and that he will have to mourn over the sin that uh, is continuing in the church. Uh, he writes this letter to 
correct them, to rebuke them, to exhort them, to uh, deal with all of these things before he goes, so that their visit can be a pleasant one. So with that, we come to the last chapter, chapter 13. Uh, we'll just begin verses 1 to 6. Someone can read that, please. This will be the third time I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witness, witnesses, every word shall be established. I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time. And now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before, to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Thank you. So um, Paul talks about his visit again. He says, again, this is the third time I'm coming to you. And then he says, uh, by the mouth of two or three witnesses. So this is from the Old Testament where uh, when they went before a judge, if there was any uh, anything that needed to be judged, anything that needed to be brought before the judge, uh, there would always have to be two or three witnesses who would be able to speak about what had happened. And so Paul is talking like a judge who's going to go to the church. And uh, people are going to have to have witnesses to share about what has happened, where they are, uh, what sin is happening in the church. And he will judge what is happening in the church. He will deal with whatever's, uh, whatever is going on there. Uh, and then he says, um, so I've told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time and now being absent, I write those to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. So he will deal with the sin that is happening in the church. Uh, if you are uh, wondering about whether it is truly Christ speaking to me, uh, you will see when I come that we will not be weak towards you. But the power of God in us uh, will be at work and we will deal with the sin that is happening in the church, any sin that is continuing in the church. Uh, so just as Christ was crucified in weakness and we ourselves are ministering in weakness, uh, but Christ now lives by the power of God, we will also deal with this sin uh, by the power of God. We will deal with what is happening in the church by the power of God. Uh, so before we come, examine yourselves. You yourself test what is happening in your midst. Uh, you examine as to whether you are walking in faith uh, and test whether Christ is in you. Uh, but Christ will not be in you if you have already been disqualified from the faith. Uh, so you may prove to be someone who has been disqualified, but we will not be disqualified because uh, we know how we have been serving God. We know uh, that God himself uh, will uh, can uh, stand for us. God uh, knows us. God knows the work that we have done. And we can stand blameless and confident before God. But you examine yourselves and see whether you can stand before Christ uh, or whether Christ is truly in you. Uh, so uh, these are very difficult words, I'm sure, very difficult, uh, what Paul was experiencing and what he's writing to the church, to write to people you've ministered to and wonder if truly they are still in the faith, if they uh, can stand and say that Christ is still in them. Uh, but uh, he doesn't uh, He doesn't try to sugarcoat anything. He's very, 
very open about what needs to be dealt with, what needs to be challenged, and why he is doing it also, because he wants them, uh, he wants to be able to present this church as that pure uh, bride to Christ. And so that sin, whatever needs to be dealt with in the church, he will do whatever needs to be done so that they can be presented uh, to Christ as a pure virgin. Uh, free from sin, free from blemish. Uh, so uh, we read here Romans uh, 8, 14 to 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And so it is the Holy Spirit within us who will affirm to us whether we are children of Christ uh, or whether we are not. Uh, and so when Paul is telling them to examine themselves, he is saying, do you truly have the Spirit of Christ in you? Is the Spirit witnessing to you that you are a child of God? Uh, and if not, then you need to uh, deal with whatever it is that is going on in your heart, in your life. Whatever sin is there, you need to deal with it. You need to uh, take that sin out. You need to uh, change the way you are living, and you need to turn to Christ again. Um, we will read the last part. Uh, let's read from 7 to 14. So we'll read from verse 7 to the end of the chapter. If someone can read that for us, please. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we appear approved, that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified, for we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray, that you may be made complete. Therefore I write these things, being absent, less being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you. So we'll uh, just close with these last few verses. Uh, so he says, um, I'm praying that you will not do any evil, uh, not for my own sake, not that I would uh, prove to be someone who is approved, uh, but that you will do what is right. Uh, so even if it seems that we are weak or it seems that we are disqualified, if you are walking in strength, that is sufficient for us. Um, and then he says, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. This is such an important uh, verse for us as believers and as ministers of God, right? That uh, this should be what we, uh, the way we walk, the way we serve. We do nothing against the truth, but always for the truth. Uh, so for us to be able to say that about our ministry is a big thing for a way for us to be able to examine what we are doing in ministry, uh, examine what we are doing as believers. Are we doing it for the truth or are we doing it against uh, the truth? And if we are doing it against the truth, then we have to uh, be able to confess that we have to be able to uh, change the way we are doing things to be right with God, uh, to be doing things the way Christ would have us do it. 
and then he says this we also pray that you may be complete so uh, in these concluding verses his uh, he uses this twice verse 9 and in verse 11 uh, that you may be complete and then verse 11 become complete uh, so to call them to perfection call them uh, to complete rightness with god a uh, full uh, restoration before god uh, and then he says, I'm writing this while I'm absent so that when we come, we won't have to deal with uh, with the sin, with the authority that God has given us, right? We are coming with the authority that God has given us. And that authority, again, he says, is for edif edification, not for destruction. Uh, so if we are dealing with sin, it is for your edification. Uh, if we are dealing uh, with people in ways that are that may seem harsh, uh, it is not to destroy you or to destroy the church, but it is uh, so that you may be built up in righteousness. Uh, and then uh, he concludes uh, with his farewell, uh, again calling them become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. Uh, so be of good comfort is... Uh, encourage one another in the faith, uh, be people who are building one another up, uh, be of one mind. So live in unity, live in peace with one another, uh, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So as we are choosing to continue in unity and peace, God himself will be in our midst. Uh, the God of love and peace will be with us. Uh, greet one another with a holy kiss. So uh, that is greet one another with brotherly love, with brotherly affection. Um, and then Paul sends his greetings from uh, the ministers who are with him. Uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So verses 14 affirms the... Uh, Trinity, right? So we know that uh, teaching in uh, the Trinity was right there from the from Paul's epistles, from these New Testament writings. Uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, it closes with that blessing over the church. Um, so we come to the end of uh, our semester and First and Second Corinthians. Um, I hope that you've been blessed as we've studied these two letters together. Um, as I said, we will have uh, feedback so you can share uh, anything, uh, anything take away from your from the class as well, things that you've learned. Uh, I will be looking at all your papers and assessing all of that as well. Uh, please do complete all of that before the deadline. Um, so we'll just close in prayer. I'll uh, pray over us and then we can close this class. Father, we uh, just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the truth that we get to uh, study and learn from and receive um, receive a revelation from, Lord, that we encounter you through your word. Uh, we just pray, Lord, as we have uh, read these two epistles, Lord, that the things that you have taught us will remain in our hearts and will bear fruit in uh, our lives and in our ministries, Lord, that you yourself will be glorified, uh, that we would walk as true ministers of God, uh, people who are accountable to you and you alone, Lord, um, even as the pressures of uh, serving people uh, might surround us and might overwhelm us, Lord, that uh, we would draw strength from you, uh, that we would draw strength from your spirit, from your word, uh, that we would walk in holiness, Lord, before you, uh, that we would be able to say that we have served only uh, according to the truth, that we have served only for the sake of truth, only for the sake of uh, the people we are serving, to see them walking in holiness, walking in righteousness uh, before you, Lord. We pray blessings over every one of us here, over every student, Lord, uh, that, uh, Lord, your truth would 
uh, source around them uh, would uh, fully fill their hearts and minds that they would be able to walk in it, Lord, uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit upon uh, each one of us, Lord. Uh, we pray uh, blessings over the end of the semester as we continue to uh, finish uh, up the semester, finish assignments, finish classes, Lord, uh, for your grace, your strength, your divine wisdom and understanding to do all that we need to do uh, for your glory, for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Um, so, yes, please feel free to email me if you have anything uh, you would like to share about the class or any other questions about papers, assignments. Uh, feel free to email me um, and please do also send in your feedback. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Thanks.